Over half of the people dying in the city of New York were children under the age of five. And this wasn't just a local catastrophe, it was everywhere. Other major cities, Philadelphia, Boston, were experiencing the same exact problem. There was a public panic, no one knew what to do, and it would take decades before they knew what was stealing away their children's lives. And when that day came, they found their smoking gun, milk. It was killing all of them. Today, we've lost track of what milk fundamentally is, which is humanity's most controversial beverage. And since it can be easily made into foods such as cheese and yogurt, it doubles down as the most controversial food as well. It was the first one ever studied in a laboratory, and for good reason. Milk gives life, but it has also taken hundreds of millions throughout history, often before they even had the ability to walk. Milk was directly responsible for the success of some of the greatest empires of human history. For some, it was an excuse for hatred, and for others, a gift in warfare. And for us today, an incredibly fascinating tale of controversy and wonder. This is the story of milk. The word mammal itself comes from a Latin word meaning of the breast, indicating that breastfeeding and in turn milk has been around ever since mammals have been, which is in the ballpark of 225 million years ago. Over this time frame, pretty much every mammal developed what we call lactose intolerance after growing out of infancy. By far, it was the norm. But some adult humans, most of which are lactose intolerant, started to drink milk. All signs point to this first being practiced in the Middle East. As to where their ability to do this and drink it without getting sick came from is honestly a mystery, but likely it came from adapting to our bodies out of necessity rather than by choice. But at this point, there is a very important question that needs to be asked. Out of all of the mammals on Earth, how was it decided which ones would be used for milk? Or better yet, which milk was the best? Well, that's one of human history's first great debates. Now, besides straight up taste preference, there are a lot of factors to be considered here, such as geography, milking difficulty, domestication difficulty, and the amount of milk produced, and the list goes on to, honestly, an uncomfortable number of milk variables. And when you factor all of these into the equation, you're left with a handful of choices that people landed on for all of human history. One of them is reindeer. Yeah, I bet you weren't expecting that one, but Northern Europeans considered it to be the best milk for some time. In some cases, there were horses, donkeys, or even camels. Then there was also the goat, and last but not least, the cow. Now, out of all of these animals, even back then in ancient times, it may or may not surprise you that cows were the most universally agreed upon. And we know this because records keep showing them popping up in places where they definitely did not belong. Cows prefer cooler climates with rich grasslands, so the fact that there is tons of evidence of ancient people going through the trouble of domesticating them in the hot and dry Middle East is a testament to their preference for the mild and sweet notes of cow milk. Somewhere in this ancient time, people got the radical idea to substitute animal milk for a baby whose mother could not produce it herself. After all, if you could not get a wet nurse, this was the only other choice. We know this because there are Egyptian milk feeding vessels dating back to 4000 BCE. And it's hard to understate just how bold of a decision this must have been for the first time it was ever attempted. But from this practice came about a number of ancient myths of children being raised by wild animals and sustaining themselves off of their milk. The most famous of which is that of Romulus and Remus, the fable about the founding of Rome. In time, that initial small and humble city sprouted to be one of the largest and most powerful empires known to man. And the Romans within it harbored some strong opinions about milk. Cheese was eaten by both the rich and the poor of Rome. However, since fresh milk was only available on farms, it was exclusively consumed by farmers' children and by peasants who lived nearby. This was because there was no way to transport milk without it becoming deadly or at least making you sick. 
Firstly, there was no way to refrigerate it, and secondly, there's no process invented to eliminate the bacteria in it. And that's primarily because people didn't even know bacteria existed. They just knew that milk left out long enough made people sick, and that the only way to avoid this was to either drink it immediately or to make it into cheese. Since milk was only drank by the low status people in and around the farms of Rome, milk itself started to have an association with low status. Only crude and uneducated people drank it, and it was extremely rare among adults of all social classes. The Romans, who loved to comment on the inferiority of other cultures, pointed to excessive milk drinking as evidence of barbarism. And since the climate of Northern Europe was significantly cooler than that of Southern Europe, transporting milk was more viable, and as a result, they drank a lot more of it. Their seeming infatuation with the substance just added another item to the list of reasons why the Romans held contempt for the barbarians to their north. But the northern infatuation with the milk only seemed so in direct comparison. In reality, they were consuming milk relatively conservatively. It was important and scarce enough to where a dry cow was seen as a major family crisis. Additionally, in Rome, it was commonly believed that milk was bad for your teeth, an idea that persisted on for centuries. This may come as a surprise to you today, as it is commonly believed to be the exact opposite. Shortly after Rome's collapse, the medieval period began, and to medieval Europeans, their diets revolved around dairy products, specifically cheese. Milk was heavily seasonal, so it could only be acquired in the spring and the summer, ironically when it is warm and most primed to spoil. Early on in the first years of Christianity, it was actually commonplace to drink milk as the blood of Christ during communion, as milk was believed to be white blood. Meanwhile, the Southern Europeans never lost their superiority complex over the larger dairy consumption of the North. The Dutch in particular were singled out as crude and comic people who endlessly engorged themselves in milk. But the Mongols, a growing empire in the process of swallowing up the entirety of Asia to their east, utilized milk in a completely different way. Logistics is often the most challenging aspect of warfare, and many wars in history have been determined by who is able to get supplies, primarily food, to the front line. This presented an especially unique challenge to the Mongols, whose largest advantage was maneuverability on horseback, and obviously the quicker you move, the harder it is to keep your supply lines connected to your soldiers. This presented them with a unique challenge, so the Mongols flipped the idea on its head. The logic went as follows. They rode everywhere on horseback, horses are mammals, mammals produce milk, humans can eat milk. So what if they could live off of the milk from the horses that transported each and every one of them? Well, then you have the ability to move anywhere at any time, and are free of the shackles of needing to dictate your movements in accordance with supply lines like your opponents do. This gave them such a game-breaking advantage that, combined with the other things they pioneered, it's no wonder that they were so efficient that they eliminated, by some estimates, 11% of the entire world's population at the time. Now, remember how I told you how the Dutch were made fun of for how much they ate dairy? Well, they didn't just eat a lot they produced a lot as well. Within a short span of time, the value of a Dutch cow quadrupled, and they were able to produce twice the milk of neighboring countries. This was because the Dutch started to selectively breed cattle and were fine-tuning what they fed them. This increase in milk production allowed them to create a massive surplus of cheese, which allowed them to export it across the globe and eventually build themselves into a major maritime empire. And seemingly overnight, the Netherlands, the place that used to be made fun of, was suddenly seen as the mecca of art, science, and engineering. Even those who had made fun of them before in Southern Europe admitted to the fact that they were wrong and started studying them to find out what made them so smart and cultured. And while those in Europe and Asia were freely adopting milk drinking, in the Americas it was a completely foreign concept. Even despite having plenty of domesticable milk producing animals, they lacked one animal in particular, until the Europeans brought it with them. 
Once Christopher Columbus returned a hero to Europe from his first expedition, he started planning a second, and there was no dispute as to which animal to bring for milk. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and he brought a few cows with him too. They eventually spread throughout Mexico and are thought to be the origin of the Texas Longhorn. As the New World continued to be colonized, more and more cows were brought overseas, but they were not an overnight success. They were attacked by mosquitoes, killed by warring tribesmen, and slaughtered for their beef in times of need, which came very often in the early days of settling. But eventually, dairying culture took off, especially in the cities of New England and New York, which by 1650 were exporting their own cheese. And at this junction, we find a turning point in the story of milk. A point where greed, death, and controversy truly start to take hold, setting us on a path to eventually find milk as we know it today. Welcome to the age of industrialization. The city of New York was growing to new heights each and every year. But even as it urbanized, the tradition of holding on to a cow or two stayed for quite some time, though due to space limitations, they were often tied to stakes and fed garbage. You could imagine the smell this would create on top of the fact that New York already had a tremendous sewage and rodent problem. In this environment, the cows would be milked into open pans and people would go around on a hot day selling it in the street. Out of all places due to sanitation problems, cities were probably the worst place to acquire milk. But this is ironically the first place where milk drinking truly caught on. But as the city grew even further, the tradition of having cows on site was dying out, meaning that there was less milk in the city, but more demand for it. To meet this demand, dairies emerged outside of the city and would transport milk to their customers, and infant mortality started to skyrocket to insane levels. In 1815, the deaths of children under the age of 5 represented 33% of the deaths in Boston, 25% in Philadelphia, and 32% in New York. This may seem alarming by today's standards, but back then this was normal. But what would soon happen was far from that. Just 24 years later in 1839, these numbers jumped to horrific levels. In Boston, the share of children's deaths increased to 43%, and in Philadelphia and New York, it had risen to over 50. This was a massive public health crisis. But milk drinking somehow continued on, even at these fatal levels. There was some suspicion that maybe it was the culprit, but people didn't truly know. By 1855, 700,000 people lived in New York and were collectively spending $6 million on milk annually. Two years later, the Common City Council of Brooklyn opened an investigation into the milk production surrounding major cities in the US, and what they found was horrific. This milk was not coming from farms, but instead a compound called a dairy brewery. Cows were brought in and housed right next to a beer brewery. Three times a day, a slop which was the byproduct of making beer flowed past them. The average cow ate around 32 gallons of this slop a day, and was given no water because it was assumed that the substance had contained everything they needed. Since they never had to chew solid food, they often lost their teeth. Since their feed was not nutritionally dense, the milk came out watery, low in fat, and with a light blue color. To solve this issue, they would add chalk to the milk to give it body, and sometimes even molasses to give it sweetness. It goes without saying that in these dairy breweries, sanitation was also something of little importance. And this is all on top of the fact that these would need to be transported for quite a distance without any refrigeration before it reached customers. For obvious reasons, this report was a bombshell when it was released, and it resulted in various milk purity laws being passed and doing away with dairy breweries for good. Near the end of the century, the lactometer was also invented, and the contents of milk could, for the first time in human history, be measured. So laws were enacted to ensure that the quality of milk was good by having mandates on certain fat percentages. Funny enough, almost all of these laws would make the most popular milks of today, such as 2%, 1%, or fat-free, illegal. In New York, for example, it was illegal for milk to be below 3% fat, otherwise you would be fined. But despite these reforms, the infant mortality rates barely dropped. The problem continued to persist. The more scientists investigated milk, the more diseases they found. 
1877, the US Public Health Service established a laboratory for the sole purposes of studying milk, making it the first ever lab-tested food. However, two decades before that, a man in France was developing a radical new theory. Bacteria had already been discovered for some time, but this man theorized that these tiny organisms caused diseases and even fermentation, and he called them germs. His name was Louis Pasteur, and he developed his theory in hopes of uncovering more about beer and wine. He had little interest in milk. In fact, the original pasteurization process was made with wine. By the time the word pasteurized was applied to milk, Pasteur was already in the last years of his life. Shortly before his death in 1895, scientists found that if they used the process he did for wine, milk would not carry diseases or sour. Meanwhile, in cities like New York and Boston, infant mortalities remained high for the next 20 years as the merits of pasteurization were debated. Pasteurized milk tasted different from raw milk, so it took some effort to warm the public up to it. But after that point, it was really up to convincing the farmers or the government. And the farmers weren't having it. Selling milk already offered very slim margins, so needing to pasteurize would add another cost and slim them down even more. This debate was deemed the milk question, and in 1908, Chicago became the first city to mandate pasteurization, and within 9 years, 46 major US cities followed suit. And child mortality rates plummeted to a degree that us today would still find alarming, but back then it was incredible progress. By this point in time, milk production had already been industrialized due to the invention of milk pumps that automated the cow milking process. The tragedy of this industrialization is that it took away jobs from women. Working in every step of the dairy business, from milking to cheese making, was seen as a female line of work and was always a major source of employment for women. This was because it was seen as farm work, which back then, especially on dairy farms, had a strong connotation with femininity. But factory work was seen as man's work, so once dairy farms started to reflect a factory more than a farm at the turn of the century, many women lost their jobs and were replaced by their male counterparts. This was common in many other lines of female work that got swallowed up by industrialization. After the Great Depression, milk price was no longer an extension of the free market, and instead it would end up being determined by the government, which would make the profit margin extremely thin, but just enough to make a bit of profit at scale. Right after World War II and into the age of the nuclear family, milk consumption itself also was changing. It stopped being delivered to doors in glass bottles, and instead was sold within cartons in supermarkets, which is where milk remains to this very day. The cow that was settled upon by most farmers across the globe is the Dutch Holstein Friesian. Brought over by Dutch settlers in 1613, it is the oldest breed of cow in America. Usually just called the Holstein, a whopping 22% of its genome has been altered by humans within the past 40 years. This is due to developments within the field of artificial insemination, which allows them to produce far more milk than anyone in the past could have dreamed of. Today, they produce approximately 10 to 20 times the amount that they would need to feed a calf and approximately 90% of the cows you find in America are Holsteins. Even from the earliest days of milk production, it was realized that humans and calves have competing interests. The result was separation in order to maximize milk output. The tragedy is that this is a necessary evil, since the margins on milk production are so low, even to simply allow a calf to use their mom for a short amount of time will make pretty much every farm inoperable and forced to shut down, especially the smaller ones because a low profit margin favors larger scales of production. That's also why, contrary to common belief, most organic milk actually comes from big factory-like farms, simply because they can actually afford to produce this type of milk, while smaller farms can't. Now, the lives of cows on a farm is in itself a very controversial topic, and it's hard to cover all the angles since each farm is different. Generally though, a cow's natural lifespan is around 20 years. On a farm, however, it depends on how well she is treated. In huge dairies where thousands of cows are lined in feedlots, you can expect only 3-4 to four years. On a smaller, gentler farm, they could live even to the age of 10. And what I mean by death is that they stop producing milk, and in that case are sent to the slaughterhouse to be used for their beef. 
Now, on those gentler farms, it is common for farmers to actually give cows names, and a number of studies suggest that music makes cows happy, so it's often played at these dairies. It's widely believed that they have a preference for classical music, but there's no evidence to actually support that. And generally, the better you treat a cow, the more milk it produces, so there is a neat little incentive there, though many factory-like farms choose not to follow it. One of the most prevalent controversies today surrounds what is fed to the cows, whether it's organic, non-GMO, or grass-fed. Ironically, grass-feeding is the cheapest way to feed a cow, but they will just end up producing less milk as a result, hence why farmers take on the extra cost of feed, which accounts for a massive 70% of their total cost for running a farm. Now, obviously cows need to get rid of the food that they eat once their body processes it, and when you're dealing with thousands of cows, manure can really start to add up, and that's an understatement. The total animal waste in the United States is estimated to be 100 times more than what is taken in by human sewage treatment plants. Sometimes it even affects the water supply, exposing around 4.5 million people to dangerous nitrate levels. But the most worrying effect is that of climate change. The United Nations recently concluded that cattle produce more greenhouse gases than automobiles do. And all of this is being done for a commodity that still has no clear consensus for whether it's actually healthy or not. That being milk. There's a growing movement of people who are buying natural, raw, and pasteurized milk in order to pursue a more natural as things should be lifestyle. But at the end of the day, there is nothing natural whatsoever about adult humans consuming the milk of another animal. When the National Dairy Council ran their infamous Got Milk campaign in which they recruited many physicians to back up the claim that milk is healthy, the Physicians Association retaliated with a mocking Got Beer campaign. Due to the nature of the work itself and the fact that there's a labor shortage, the future of milk is one of robots and automation. It's doubtful that the old debates around milk will be resolved then either. Most of them will continue to remain contentious for centuries. Additionally, the ethics of further automating the milking process will likely bring its own wave of controversies. As human history has always shown that as our civilization develops, it creates more, not fewer, arguments about milk. Now, if I happen not to go deep enough into the specifics of the milk controversies, trust me, there are plenty of videos out there that do a way better job than I ever could have explaining the science behind it. Plus, quite frankly, I suck at science, especially navigating controversies like I would need to here. So, I'm sticking to my strengths. If you yourself happen to know any fun facts about milk, I encourage you to leave a comment. I would love for the comment section to be just as educational as the video itself. In fact, I'll start by mentioning a cool fact that didn't make it into the video. Thank you so much for watching to this point. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one.